finishing our series today called Born to Reign. Look at somebody and say, you were born to reign. You were born to reign. In fact, it says that in Romans chapter 5, that we are able to reign in life through Christ. Not because we're awesome, not because we're so accomplished, or because we've done a lot of incredible things, but because Jesus accomplished and did a lot of incredible things and our life is hidden in him and so through him we will also reign in this life and you have victory in your life did you know that you have victory in your life you have victory over sin you have victory over shame come on you have vic victory over lack come on you have victory over sickness come on this is all in you through Christ through everything that he accomplished on the cross that day you now have these provisions in your life and you can reign in life through Christ come on and that's the key through Christ not because you're accomplished not because you were a good boy, not because you're on the nice list or because you're on the naughty list, but because Jesus finished the list. Come on. And so because we are in him, we can reign in life. And our text throughout this series, and we will keep it short today, but our text throughout this series is taken from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, for to us, everybody say to us, for to us, a child is is born. How many know that Jesus was born to us? He wasn't just born to Mary and Joseph. He was born for all creation. And in fact, scriptures tell us that, that he was the firstborn of all creation. And so for to, to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government, the government that he brings will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And the increase of his government and the increase of his peace will know no end. So when Jesus established his kingdom on the earth, when he showed up in that manger that day, that kingdom will never, ever, ever end. And what I love about it is that Jesus didn't come to just save us. He did come to save us, but he came to establish his government. He came to lead us. He came because we needed a king in our life. We needed a good king in our life. Come on, we'd, we'd been subject to the rulers of the age. We've been subject to, to our carnality and our flesh. But Jesus looked at us and he said, he said they are like sheep without shepherds. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down there and I'm going to reveal myself to them and I'm going to lead their life. And I'm going to lead them right into salvation. Come on. And from that point that we can follow his leader leadership. And so We've been in this series, week one, we talked about that Jesus was given to govern. Come on, he wasn't just given as a, an eight-pound baby Jesus. He was given as a king. He was given to govern our life. He rules over all that was. He rules over all that is. And he rules over all that is to come. Come on, that Jesus uh, revealed himself. We talked about the shepherds in that, that day that were hanging out, working the night shift. Come on, like many shepherds did at the bottom of the totem pole society. There they are working. And God reveals himself to shepherd and we, shepherds and they went from shepherding sheep to shepherding an encounter that they have. Remember, they went out and they shared the good news of Jesus. And then we talked last week about how King Herod, when the wise men show up to King Herod, we're going to be talking about the wise men today, and when they show up to King Herod two years after Jesus is born, and they show up and they say, we've come to worship him, and he's like, worship who? And he, they begin to see Jesus as a threat. And at that time, Herod issues a decree to kill all the babies in Bethlehem, all the baby boys that were under two years old in Bethlehem. And we talked about that that is the plan of the enemy, that he wants to come in and he wants to destroy the reign of God. He's going to attempt to do that. But the only way that he has dominion over your life is if you say yes to his destruction. Come on. Because God provided a way out through Joseph and Mary, and he provides a way out for us. So he rescues us and he puts us in this kingdom and, and, and Jesus doesn't rule. When we talk about being kings, we're not talking about the, the world's kind of rulership. Come on, we rule with the hearts of servants and we serve with the hearts of kings, right? So we're called servant kings. So our identity is royalty and serving is our assignment. Did you know that? Your identity is royalty, but serving is your assignment. So God has given you this kingdom to administer the kingdom to the world. That's how we reach the world is we give all this in our possession. Are you tracking? I know that's a lot. So that was the whole series in a nutshell. And today we're going to finish up this series talking about these wise men. It says this in Matthew chapter 2, verse 9. The star that they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was born. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. One translation uses the word astonished. I like to say they were astonished. It was a little better in the first service. So, 
so, sometimes astonished. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So appreciate that, appreciate that. <laughs> now I can go home with a smile on my face. All right. So when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. Come on, overjoyed. They weren't just kind of happy. They were over happy. They were overjoyed on coming to the house. Now, again, this is two years after baby Jesus. So he's toddler Jesus at this point. He's getting into everything. Come on, they're putting all those little locks on their cabinets. You guys know how it is. So coming to the house, they saw the child was with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down. Can you imagine a little two-year-old child? Here they come, these kingly, dignified men bow down and worship him. And it says this, that they opened their treasures. So you got to think about these are These are guys that are fully loaded. They have these immaculate treasure chests full of treasures. And they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and incense or frankincense and myrrh. See, there's a, there's a lot about these, these wise men uh, that we know. First of all, we know that they were kingly. In fact, we have a song that says, We Three Kings, right? And we don't know that there were three kings. There were a lot more than three people. There might have only been three kings, but kings of that day, and just like kings of today, travel with an entourage. So they weren't traveling just three guys, you know, on camelback, you know, kind of walking through the desert, drinking water. No, they had their tents, and they, had, they brought as much palace as they could with them. I mean, they had tents that were set up probably ahead of them every night in the desert when they're traveling for these two years, and they are still living their lavish life. So they have a whole entourage when they show up to meet Jesus that day. And so think about all this. So they were, they were kingly. Even though they weren't kings of nations, they lived like kings because of the resources that they had. Come on, just like you and I, we have heavenly resources. And so there were these three gifts, but there were probably more than three kings, definitely more than three people. The, the next thing we know about these men is that they were wise and educated. So they, they had went to school. Come on. They had the degrees. Their opinion carried weight. They were, they were wise and educated. They were astrologers, and they were interpreters of dreams. So these guys, they were kind of in the, new, the, the know of things, all things mystical, right? Dreams, prophecies, all that kind of stuff. They, they, these guys were like, they, they knew all that stuff. So they were, they were wise and educated, but they were also highly regarded. So I love in this story that you have shepherds, come on, which are kind of at the bottom of the totem pole of society to these wise men who are like at the top. I mean, they are like, they are like the, the mo they are like the influencers of the age. And so you've got the, the lowest of men and the highest of men all coming to the one man, the one man who, who is recognized for all creation, who reaches the lowest of lows and reaches the highest of high. And I was reminded of this passage that David shares with us in Psalm 36, he says, how priceless. And I think they got that. I think they realized that what God was offering was priceless. How priceless is your unfailing love. Both high and low among men find refuge in the shadow of your wings. So I love that God chooses the lowest of society to the highest of society to come to do what? To worship. To come and worship the man Jesus and the baby Jesus at that time. And so little toddler, two-year-old Jesus. So a couple of things about wise men. Wise men, first of all, wise men seek. Wise men seek. See, it's, it's foolish to stop seeking. See, we have all these people who think that because they turned 18 years old, they, stop, they can stop seeking because they know everything. How many of y'all were like that? How many of you realize the older you get, the less you know? Yeah. And so Wise men don't stop seeking. See, it's foolish to think that you've arrived at this thing called knowledge. And so these guys were, were invested two years of their life to seek the one that the prophecy spoke of, to, to seek the one that the, the stars spoke of. They are, had devoted their life to seeking him. So wise men seek. And I believe this, that wise men still seek him. Y'all might have seen that before. Wise men still seek him. Number two is wise men worship. In fact, this was the whole point of their journey. This, this, this was the reason why they left the comfort of their palaces so they could seek him. Why? To seek him, to worship him, not to get something. Oh, come on. Not to get something from the king, but to give him something, to worship him. So they leave their comfort. Come on, this tells you something about worship. Worship is not about your comfort. Come on, it's about getting out of what's comfortable. It's about getting in to something that's uncomfortable to give him something. So they leave their comfort. 
their journey was all about worship. In fact, it says that in Matthew chapter 2, verse 2, when they, they go before Herod, they said, we've seen his star in the east. We know he's here. We've come to worship. We've come to worship. This is what we came for. Some of you have a hard time getting out of bed on a Sunday morning to come and worship. These guys traveled two years to come and worship. But we're glad you're here. Really, really glad you're here. And I'm, I'm not trying to be silly. I'm serious. But this was the intent of their journey. So wise men seek. Wise men worship. And the third thing that we see about these wise men is that wise men give. In fact, they were outrageously generous givers. And it's not because they were rich. Come on. Because some, peop- some people, $2 is generous. Let's just be real. But they gave what they had. They were outrageously generous. And it wasn't just the gifts that they were presented, which were very valuable. It's because that they gave up four years of their life. Come on, it's one thing to give your money and your treasure. It's another thing to give your time. Here are these guys, prestigious men. Gave up four years of their life, two years to get there and two years to get home. Four years of their life to worship Jesus. There's wisdom in that. There's wisdom to pursuing Jesus, to being to pursuing him in your generosity. They were fully invested. I mean, what a pain for these men who knew nothing but comfort. So they sought, they worshiped, and they gave generously. They were seeking, they were worshiping, and they were giving. Let's talk about these gifts that they give. First of all, they give a gift of gold. Why? Why? Why did they give gold? Well, gold is really the gift that is fit for kings. And in this day, the the, the most precious thing that you could give someone is the gift of gold. So gold speaks of the royalty of Jesus. It's the gift for kings. It's the gift for the king of kings. And these guys had a lot of gold. And we're not told how much gold they gave them, but they were saying, Jesus, you are the king. We give you the gift that is only fit for a king. Gold also speaks of his divinity, right? It speaks of, of Jesus being God in the flesh. See, gold all throughout the scripture was was used as a way to signify that someone is divine. So we see this when people would stop following God and they would build idols. What would they build them out of? Gold. Why? Because gold was fit for divinity. So here they are bringing gold to the divine one. And we also see the temple, right? The temple, what was the temple covered in? gold. It was covered in gold. Why? Because gold speaks of his divinity. So when they gave him gold, they were speaking of his royalty and they were speaking of his divinity. They were saying he is God who is king. And it goes back to the, to the Old Testament. When we read through the Old Testament, it says that the people wanted a king. They wanted to be like other nations. And God said, I want to be your king. God ended up giving them what they wanted. And then he gave, gave them what they needed with Jesus. Come on. So they gave him gold. Number two, they gave him frankincense. Now, the translation we read says incense. Now, this is the incense that was used by the priest. The, P, the priest in the temple worship, when they would minister to the Lord, we get this question a lot. Uh, you're not the only one that has a question. What does it mean to minister to the Lord? Minister to the Lord means that you're focused on the Lord. That's really what it means. It means you're setting your attention and your affection. We call that worship. When you pray, you're ministering to the Lord. You're asking him to minister to you, but that ministers to him when when you do that. Isn't that awesome? So God gets ministry. We minister to the Lord by him ministering to us. Isn't that awesome? So good. So when you just get before him and you worship him, like what we did in worship for a few minutes today, some of y'all thought you were singing Christmas, Christmas carols, but you showed up to worship. And so when you sing, it doesn't matter what the song is, by the way. Come on. So you, don't, you don't have to like the song. If you're a worshiper, you're going to press in. Come on. It don't matter. It don't matter what style it is or how loud it is. You just press in because you're a worshiper. But, but the priests, what they did is, is they would, before the Lord, they would go and they would burn incense before the Lord day and night, night and day. This was their job. This was the focus of their life. They were incredibly focused just on one thing, the presence of God. And they ministered on behalf of the people to the Lord. And so frankincense is basically saying if if Jesus is the king of kings to the gold, he's saying that he is the priest of all priests. See, Jesus, not only did he have a, a, a priestly mandate on his life, he's the last priest we'll ever need. See, you don't need a priest. A priest is someone who represents men to God. You don't, you only need one rep. You only need one rep. 
You only need, you don't need me. Come on, you don't need Pastor Nathan. He's great. You need to talk to him. But you don't need a rep. You could go straight to Jesus. He's, listen, he is the great high priest. He is also the final high priest. Jesus is the last priest. He's a priest of all priests. So I love what it says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11. Under the old covenant, the priest stands before the ministers, before the altar day and night, offering the same sacrifices again and again. Why again and again? Because the people kept sinning again and again. So every day they had to go, well, they sinned, they screwed up, so let's go, let's go back at it, right? Day after day, it's the same. They did it again, Lord. Here we are. Day after day, not after night, before the Lord, because of the, sin, the people of sin. And it says this, that it, they were offering sacrifices that couldn't even take away sin. They might be able to forgive the sin, but it could not eliminate the sin. But how many know that Jesus broke the power of sin? He broke the control of sin. That's why you're not a sinner anymore. Because Jesus broke that old identity off of you. Now you're a son of God. Now you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He broke it off. But our high priest, so they again and again, they didn't do any good. Because the next day they're going to go do it again. But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for our sins. A single sacrifice for our sins, check this out, good for all time. The only time it ever needed to be done, it's been done. See, you don't have to pay for your sins. Well, I've just got to pay for my sins. I have this rough, you don't have to pay for your sins. Jesus already paid for your sins. He's the final sacrifice once for all time. It's done. It's done. It's finished. That's why he said it on the cross that day. It is finished. It's all over. You don't have to go to a man. That's why that temple veil was torn. It's done. My work here is done. And then it says this, by showing the work was done, then he sat down. And that's what you do when your work's done. You sit down. So when he sat down beside the Father, beside the Father, he said, my work here is done. He sat down. He said, now you can just come to me directly. You don't have to go to a priest. You don't have to go to no temple. You just come directly to the Son of God. You have access. So it speaks of his of his priestly role. So we have the gift of gold that speaks of his royalty and his identity, his frankincense, which which speaks of his priesthood. And third of all, we have myrrh. Now what myrrh was is it's got you got it the same way that you got frankincense. It was it was extracted from a tree. It was like the sap from a tree and they would burn it and crush it into oil and all this kind of stuff. So myrrh was by the way, this isn't the only time that myrrh was given to Jesus. Myrrh was used in embalming dead bodies. So by them bringing myrrh, they were saying, hey, listen, you are not only the priest, you're also going to be the sacrifice. Because the priest would offer sacrifice. They were saying, listen, you're going you're gonna to suffer and you're going to die. So we're giving you myrrh now ahead of time. Now, Jesus, I don't know what happened to that myrrh, but I know later on in Jesus' life, after Jesus dies... While Jesus is dead, somebody shows up at the tomb, and guess what they're giving him? Myrrh. Because myrrh speaks of the sacrifice of Jesus. It speaks of the suffering of Jesus. Beloved, forgiveness, forgiveness is only attained through sacrifice, but it's not attained through yours. He made the sacrifice. And because he made the sacrifice, we live sacrificial lives. So myrrh speaks of the Savior. The Savior was born. He saved the people from what? From hell? No. That's part of it. You get out of hell. Praise God. But what he saved you from is your sins. He saved you from your sins. And so how, how do you know if someone's saved or not? Well, did God save them from their sins or did they jump back into them? What are you saved from? What are you saved from? You're saved from your sins. You're not just saved from hell. Hell's a result from your sins. Come on. You're saved from your sins and the results of that. So today, we have these three gifts. How does that connect to my life? Today, listen, we bring, our gifts are similar. We bring similar gifts. We open our treasures. Come on, the treasure of our life, and we offer the Lord the same thing. We offer him gold. What is gold? Think about the most valuable thing in your life. And most of us would say something like, my family, my spouse, 
But all of us, really, the most valuable thing to us is ourself. It really is. It's just in our nature to put ourselves first, right? When you're one of the first words that came out of your mouth when you were a little child was mine, right? Right? Be- why? Because you were born that way. You were born with that in your nature to put yourself first. And so when, when we bring him gold, listen, we don't bring him gold be- because he needs gold. Come on. <laughs> we, bring him, we don't bring him gold to add value to him. We bring him gold recognizing his value. Come on. So we bring our best. We bring our lives. Why do we bring our best? Because he's the best. So I give my best to God because he is the best. So I live a life with gold. I'm saying I live a life of gold. I live a life that values him. That he is the highest value in my life. That he carries the most weight in my life. That he has the loudest voice in my life. I bring him gold. Secondly, we bring him frankincense. And frankincense speaks of the priesthood. And so as a priest, listen, what was a priest's role? A priest's role was to be focused on the Lord. It was Their focus was the Lord. It was day and night, night and day before the Lord, worshiping the Lord, seeking the Lord. And whatever they were doing, they were focused on the Lord. This was their mandate. Beloved, this is what our gift is whenever we offer our focus. So when we say we're bringing frankincense, we're saying, we're saying this, we're saying a life that is focused on him. So I'm bringing a life that values him, and I'm bringing a life that is focused upon him. That my life, the point of my life, come on, the point of your life is not to go out and get a good job so your kids can go to a great college, so they can get up, grow up and have lots of money, so they can raise kids, and they can go to a great college, so they can have a lot of student debt and a big job to pay off all that student debt. Nothing wrong with any of that. But that is not the point of life. He is the point of life. He is the one that is, that, is, that is asking for our attention. So we're saying, my life values him. My life is focused on him. And third of all, we bring him myrrh. When we speak of myrrh, we're speaking of that sacrificial life. And I love the way Paul says it in Romans chapter 12. He says, we offer ourselves as living sacrifices. Listen, Jesus already died. You don't have to die for Jesus. But you can live for him living sacrificially, saying, Lord, I lay down my life to follow you. I lay down everything I have. I I lay down all that is valuable to me because I recognize the value in you. I'm following you, Jesus. You are worth my life. Beloved, I, I encourage you today to surrender your life to the only one who's worthy of it. Surrender your life to the only one who's worthy of it. Your spouse ain't, spouse ain't worthy of your life. Your kids aren't worthy of your life. Only Jesus is worthy of your life. And if you surrender your life to Jesus, you'll do better at home. You'll do better with your spouse. You'll do better with your kids. You'll do better at work. You'll be a better employee if you'll just surrender your life completely and totally to him. So we worship him. We bring these gift out of our, gifts out of our values, out of our focus, and out of, out of our surrender, we're saying, Lord, this is how I choose to live my life now. I'm going to value in everything, you, everything I do. I'm going to focus on you. You are going to be the point of my life. And then you're saying, Lord, I am surrendered to you. I must decrease. I must decrease. And you must increase. You are the point 